There's a crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border where hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens are entering the United States. As the federal government makes moves to try to fix this issue, however, the opposite may in fact be true. It appears that based on funding, based on operations, and based on other things, the federal government may in fact be helping facilitate the mass migration of individuals into the heartland of the United States. This includes, for example, payments being done to organizations helping facilitate these operations in cooperation directly with the United Nations, which is helping run these operations throughout Latin America. To learn more about this, we sat down for an interview with Representative Tom Tiffany during a recent trip to Del Rio, Texas. Hey, Congressman Tiffany, thanks for being on Crossroads. It's good to be here today. Now, I want to start off, you've made some pretty strong comments, and maybe some of our viewers have seen them by now, where you were saying that essentially the federal government is running one of the biggest human trafficking operations, I mean, in the world, essentially. I mean, that's a strong statement to make. How do you justify this statement? Yeah, really strong words. At a minimum, it's facilitating. You look at what's happened since January 20th, when the Biden, President Biden, one of the first things he did, got rid of Remain in Mexico, started catch and release, and stopped border construction. What's happened? We're gonna have over two million people that come into our country illegally this year. It's very clear that the United States government, at the behest of the Biden administration, is facilitating. As a result of that signal they sent to the rest of the world, illegal immigration is on steroids here in America. Now we're here in Del Rio, Texas, just across the uh, the border from Mexico, and uh, I understand you've been doing a lot of research here. You've been, of course, traveling around quite a bit in the Darien Gap and elsewhere. What are you currently looking into with this, and why do you think this is such a big issue? Yeah, so we've been in a variety of places, but we thought it was really good timing to come to Del Rio. Uh, we started out the day by meeting with the sheriff from Kinney County, and uh, Sheriff Cole and really had a good discussion with him. He's sharing the impact on their county, the costs that are being incurred in their county as a result of what's happening, but primarily on the citizens of the county, like the ranchers. And so we have those meetings. We were able to uh, fly the Rio Grande today. Every sector is different. And so it's good to get that bird's eye view. So just trying to get that look at what is happening because things have changed even in just a few months here. Hmm. Now you mentioned that January 20th, Biden's inaugurated, and, you know, elections happen, change in administration, and suddenly things changed with the, uh, the immigration crisis. What changed and what are you hearing with that? Yeah, so first two things that President Biden did is he said, Keystone Pipeline, we're not going to build it. The pipeline from Panama and Central America to the United States we're going to start it up, and that's exactly what happened. As a result, Remain in Mexico required people to do their asylum inquiry from Mexico. 90% of them were being rejected because they did not have a legitimate asylum uh, claim. So it changed everything, but the signals were very clear. In fact, we heard from Border Patrol when I did my first trip down to Texas this year in early April, we heard from Border Patrol that they were starting to already queue up at the border. And we heard the same thing when we were in Panama. They were starting to queue up in Colombia and South America to try to make that run up the pipeline to get to the United States. So they knew what Joe Joe Biden had said on the campaign trail, and they expected that he was going to follow through on it, and man, has he followed through on it. You're talking about the people looking to illegally immigrate to the United States. That's exactly right. Now, I understand that there's some different special protections that they're being given right now. Uh, that it's a temporary protection or something like that. Can you explain it to us? What, what protections are being given to these illegal immigrants coming across? Um, under catch and release, people are just able to come into the country and then they can go wherever they want to. And they're being told that just be sure to show up for your asylum hearing. Who's showing up for their asylum hearing? Especially when the United States government is not enforcing that. So there are no protections in place. Going through the process of getting a visa, of getting legal citizenship, none of them are having to do that. Now, you know, one thing that I'm looking into down here is human trafficking. And I mean, I was anticipating finding the cartels being the main human trafficking organizations, but now I find out there's all these NGOs. What do you know about these NGOs? 
it's really interesting to see. So uh, first trip here in April um, down in the McAllen area, Border Patrol said, if you watch um, like down in uh, Mexico, Central America, you'll see an organization called IOM, sometimes OIM, the two, term, two letters are turned around, um, Organization for uh, Immigration, uh, International Migration. And um, uh, they said, watch for them because you may see them. And sure enough, heard about them in McAllen, found them down in Panama. They were the chief facilitator of moving people up that first step of the pipeline to Panama. And then at the end of August, when the Afghan evacuees came to a variety of uh, bases, army bases around the country, including Fort McCoy in Wisconsin, guess what I heard from the commanding officer? He said, yes, uh, OIM will be here to facilitate resettling these people. So they're everywhere and you have the NGOs that are out there. It is something that we need to take a much deeper look. And I know my office is beginning the process of looking at how IOM is getting their funding, where it's coming from, what's their relationship, their United Nations outfit, but what's their relationship with the United States government? Because I've been told that they're contracted by the State Department to do their work. There's a lot of questions that revolve around that and we need to know what they are doing because it should not be an international organization that is doing resettlement in America. It should be our government, and our government is not doing that at this point. So the United Nations, through the Organization of International Migration, the UN branch, is essentially managing this crisis from the very beginning of it down to the Darien Gap, all of it, the resettlement in the United States. Is, is this what you're seeing? Yeah, from what I've seen, they provide a variety of services from um, taking care of paperwork for those that are seeking to come into the country, as well as getting them supplies that, for example, when they come out of the Darien Gap, these people would be in horrible shape. Some people being wheeled up in wheelbarrows to the medical tent, they would get them some help with clothing and stuff like that. So. There's a variety of things they do. I would like to know the extent of it. Now, is there any legal basis that they're using to bring people here? And I mean, we assume getting them to work, or I mean, we we'd assume they come into this country. They either have to one get jobs or go on government services, government welfare. Technically, they can't do either if they're here illegally. So, what is the legal process for this? One of the ways in which the Department of Homeland Security is. Um, short-circuiting or working their way around um, some of the impediments that are in the way is they use the parole authority. For example, the Afghan evacuees, they were supposed to come in on special immigrant visas, right? That's what we were told by the administration. Hardly any of them had the SIV visa. So what did they do? They used the parole authority, Secretary Mayorkas used parole authority to just give mass parole um, to these people coming into the country. Now, first of all, parole was never meant for that. That was meant to be used in individual cases that were unusual around the world to allow somebody to come into the country. They have taken that and supercharged it to where, uh, I think with the Afghan evacuees, there's like 60,000 here on parole. But what the parole allows them to do, they can get a driver's license, they can um, get work permits, and that is happening already with the Afghan evacuees in Fort McCoy. So they get those things, and if they get those things, then that qualifies them for the public benefits. So they can get welfare, they can get social benefits, they can get whatever else. You know, you think about there's food stamps, there's um, you know energy credits, low low income energy credits that people can get for like their winter heating bills. There's a whole variety of things that states have that allow people to get benefits like that, that's, um, that's the initiating force for them to be able to get those benefits. And it's those NGOs and others that make sure people sign up for all of those public benefits. I see. And how many people are we talking here, roughly? Who can get this? Well, anybody that, um, that comes in on parole, I believe, can, can get that. So, for example, with the Afghan evacuee example, I mean, there's close to 60,000, 50, 60,000 people, I don't know the exact number, that are here on parole. They got that driver's license, they got that work permit, 
and you can bet the resettlement agencies are doing everything they can to help them uh, apply for those public benefits. I guess just last question. You know, I, I think a lot of people feel like they're pressed between two different forces. Everyone's focused on the migrants. Everyone's focused on people illegally immigrating to the United States. They're not focused on the system that is facilitating it. That these are people who are basically being, you know, pushed through, victimized by you know, cartel organizations, criminal organizations, used politically by different narratives and political narratives, and who knows what else with IOM and these other organizations. Uh, the focus is on them, but it seems much bigger. And you deal with you know some of the local law enforcement here, like Sheriff Cole, who are really pressed between you know two different forces: this huge migration crisis and the political forces in Latin America and the international community, like the United Nations, and between you know politics right here in America. And they're just doing their best to keep their own communities safe. I mean, what can be done here in the United States to solve this? So that's why we're here today is third trip to the Texas border now this year, the trip to Panama, and of course we talked about Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. I wanna draw that picture for the American people. That's what we're trying to do, is show the American people that this is part of a bigger piece of cloth, and that there are things that can be done. And I'm hopeful at some point here, um, if we can move on from this open borders crowd that controls Congress at this point, President Biden clearly being an open borders president, that we get some people that say, let's build a rational immigration system. Because it's not simple, but it must be done. And it can be done if we just put our minds to it, where we reward people who want to come to our country in a legal fashion, and that we end the human suffering that's happening as a result of turning the key on January 20th, and having all these people who are the unsuspecting players in this drama and they being harmed in their local communities, there is not, there's no reason for that to happen. Hey, Congressman Tiffany, thanks for being on Crossroads. It's good to be here.